Welcome to all. So today we are going to see on corrosive poisoning. As far as corrosive poisoning is concerned, you need to know what you need to do and what you definitely need not do. Okay. So as far as corrosive poisoning is concerned, the word corrosive means to go on. That means to eat away. It represents a group of chemicals that have the capacity to cause tissue injury on contact by some chemical reaction. The word chemical reaction, I'm saying that it might self increase the heat generation, thereby it can aggravate the injury. Okay. So average home contains a dozen of different cleaning products which contains either an acid or an alkali. The estimated prevalence of this corrosive poisoning is around 2.5 to 5 percent with the morbidity of more than 50 percent and the mortality if not handled properly is as high as 13 to 15 percentage and about 80 percentage of this occurs in children that is below 5 years of age. Why this is significant is if you clearly watch the airway management in adult is completely different from airway management in children because the airway itself is very thin, very narrow and we have its own challenges as far as the children airway is concerned. So if the injury is 80 percent in the children and the airway management is inadequate, you're going to lose the children for sure. The route of entry, we are going to speak about the ingestion path and inhalation is very rare. And the most common is going to be the sodium hypochlorite. That's the bleach which we say it's most common as far as the American Association of Poison Control Centers is. In developing countries such as India, we still use acids for most of the cleaning products in the house. Okay. In your own house, you might see some acid components used for cleaning, right? So in developed countries, it's more likely an alkali, which is used as a cleaning product. But in developing countries, it is acid still being used as a cleaning product. So it mostly is accidental in children and intentional in adults. So what you need to know about an acid and alkali, both are corrosives, right? So why should you even differentiate whether it should be acid or alkali? The most common acids being the sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid, which is used in the car batteries and descalers. Nitric acid, which is used in metal cleaners, hydrogen fluoride, which is a rust remover, and the other disinfectants like phenol, boric acid, these are the most common acids being used. As far as alkali is concerned, the bleach, which is most common, uses the hypochlorite, and the sodium hydroxide, the drain cleaners, and the ammonia, which is mostly used in the household cleaners and detergents. You need to understand that ammonia is given a specific segment here because ammonia has the potential to cause a gas formation. Okay. So when the gas increases, it itself can cause more amount of systemic absorption and the volume in the stomach can increase causing more perforation chances. Okay. So now coming to the same question, why should we know whether it's an acid injury or an alkali injury? Both are corrosives, right? Most of the time we think that acid is going to cause more of an injury. But to be very specific, it is alkali which is more dangerous than acid. This is what the first point I want to tell you is alkali is more dangerous than acid okay in superficial terms okay this can differ based upon the concentration of the acid or based upon the quantity the patient has consumed though those things also matters but in general it is the alkali which is more dangerous than the acid why so it is is when consumed the acid causes coagulation necrosis meaning it will form a esker esker meaning it's like a wall right so it's like a thick wall it will cause the denaturation of the proteins for example you have the esophagus here Okay, think this is a esophagus and this is what you see here is a mucosal membrane. Okay, so and uh, there comes the stomach. So if you clearly see acid causes denature of proteins and coagulation necrosis. So it forms a thin thick esker over these walls. So that esker itself does two main functions. One it somehow prevents the penetration, right? It itself forms a thick wall. So it prevents penetration. And second, since the esker has formed a smooth road, the acid travels deep into the stomach also, okay? It has the pathway to go into the stomach. So this is what you will see in an acid injury, meaning that the chances of perforation on day zero is actually minimal. You'll see more amount of esker formation because of denaturation of the proteins. And because there is a thick esker, this itself limit the depth of injury and the chance of perforation is actually less. Okay, this is number one. And second, the contra for the alkali. If you check, check out the alkali, alkali causes liquefactive necrosis. Uh, this is meaning as fat saponification, meaning when somebody consumes an alkali, all this fat, all the mucosal membrane over this esophagus, 
goes for liquefactive necrosis. So the depth of penetration is also more. The transmural injury is more. So when there is an injury, when there is a penetration, more amount of damage is expected in the proximal area itself. Okay. So acid injury causes more amount of distal injury, that is the stomach and stuff. And alkyl injury causes more amount of proximal injury, like oral airway and the uh, upper esophagus area. Okay. Since there is a severe penetration here and severe laryngospasm, this will not have a tract to go to the stomach. So the chances of distal injury in alkali is less. The chances of penetration in alkali injury is more. Okay. The opposite is true for acid injury. The chances of penetration is less, but distal injury is more because acid forms escar. That is because of coagulation necrosis. Alkali forms liquefactive necrosis. Thereby forms more amount of penetration, laryngospasm, esophageal spasm. So it is more amount of a proximal injury than the distal injury. So this is what you need to know about an acid injury and alkali injury.